these rare photomicrographs show a liquid becoming a liquid crystal. But what's a liquid crystal? According to the textbook, they shouldn't exist. They do, however, and they're about to become much a part of our everyday lives. They may even explain some fundamental mysteries of life itself. In industry and medicine, they're finding many uses, and someday a liquid crystal screen may provide your flat screen wall television that can be viewed in full sunlight. We're even going to let them spell out the title of the program for you. Interface, where dissimilar things meet. In this case, your inquiring mind and a factual adventure from the universe of science and technology. Our host, Dr. Albert Hibbs. Hello. If you'll uh, pardon the pun, I'm getting first-hand exposure to our subject tonight. Mary Ellen Ziegert is spraying a coating of liquid crystals on my hand for a demonstration of medical uses of the material. Now these are micro-encapsulated liquid crystals and they've been provided by National Cash Register. The instigator of this uh, black-handed deed is Dr. John T. Chrissy, University of Southern California Medical Center, a dermatologist and leading researcher in liquid crystals. And Dr. Christy, Chrissy, uh, just uh, what have you done to me here and why? We sprayed a coating of liquid crystals on here which will show the temperature of your skin underneath. Uh, you have to... Uh, Remember that in liquid crystals, blue represents a warm temperature and red a cold temperature with green in between, the opposite of what you might uh, think. So and right around the end of the fingernail here where it's a little bit red, that's cold, huh? That's colder. Your free edge of your nail is off in space there and radiating heat more than your uh, green nails themselves. And of course, the veins are uh, showing on the back of your hand where they drain this blood up over the top of uh, your hand. Now, since they're red, that means uh, what? That they're... Right at the moment, that means they're filled with blood, which is colder than the surrounding and the tissue green there. skin next to it. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. Well, wh incidentally, why is it, was it necessary to paint my hand black before you put on the liquid crystal? You have to paint it black so that you'll absorb that amount of light, which, is which uh, uh, would be reflected back to your eye and, dis and disturb the color patterns that you have uh, with your liquid crystals. Oh, I see. They just uh, then reflect out certain frequencies. Otherwise, and if it wasn't black, everything would come back. I couldn't see it. The wavelengths of light that come back are the colored ones, and uh, they represent the temperature you know, directly beneath them. Well, how, uh, what are the medical applications of this particular sort of business, other than making a very curious pattern on the back of my hand? Well, this is really the first time we've ever been able to see patterns uh, of temperature on the skin with such uh, precision, and uh, we were faced right away with uh, making a sort of temperature map of normal human skin. And uh, 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 here I think you can see uh, uh, a hand as it exists in a... Uh, um, cold environment. The back of the hand is red, therefore. We have a bottle of warm water in this man's hand so that it uh, makes these veins on the back of the hand stand out blue. And, uh, uh, and then you can reverse this picture and uh, uh, warm up the room so the hand shows blue. Put a mm -hmm. bottle of cold water in there and you see that you've reversed the veins to red colored on the back of the hand, which shows the flexibility of these materials in medical research. Well, does it have any di diagnostic application when you can measure temperature this way? It does in, in almost any uh, type of disease that will uh, affect blood flow to the skin. Uh, you can uh, show the area as being colder or warmer. Tumors, for example, of different types may change that. Here's a normal face. You can see how complex the normal pattern of the skin is. And uh, uh, if you had uh, some sort of medical lesion which interrupted blood flow in there, you could see cold spots where there ought to be warm ah, spots in this type of Of course, thing. first you have to know the regular pattern. You do. Um, Here's a, something of great current interest. Um, this is a man's hand as it would exist in a warm environment. It's quite blue out there at the fingers. We then had this gentleman take a few puffs on a cigarette, and within a few seconds, I think you can see that he's dropped the temperature of his hand uh, almost three degrees, shutting off the blood vessels so that the nicotine in the cigarettes uh, constricts and those this, blood this vessels. this, you say, was just a few seconds? Just a few seconds. That's right. 
Here in California, we're much interested in the effects of sun on the skin, and uh, this is, here we've uh, made a sunburn on a man's skin by projecting uh, ultraviolet light through an X-shaped pattern, and uh, then we've sprayed liquid crystals over the top of the pattern, and you can see the, the uh, heat pattern developing. We can extract quantitative information from that, which will give us a way of telling just how much damage has been done to the skin with that particular dose of ultraviolet light. And uh, the, the uh, application you mentioned when we were looking a moment ago at, this, at the picture of the face, uh, you said that if there were any sort of uh, anything underneath the skin that would block off the temperature, did you mention tumors? Or That's this, right. That uh, of some of the tumors, uh, uh, ty different types of cancer will change the blood flow over the skin and show up as warm patterns in this. Uh, uh, other types of tumors that are benign mm -hmm. often will show colder over the surface of the skin. So that being investigated right at the moment, uh, it may be of considerable help in differentiating between those two types of things. You see anything wrong with my hand, by the way, so long as you've doped it up like that this? That looks like a pretty normal hand to me. It does. Well, all right. That's, that's reassuring, at least. Well, this, uh, this is a rather new application, of course, for a uh, new, not application, but actually a new diagnostic technique. Now, yes, it certainly you know. is. Well, Dr. Chrissy, I want to thank you very much. We also have to point out that uh, this thermal mapping that we've been talking about like by liquid crystals can also be used to study sick things as well as uh, sick people. And Mr. George V. Lukianoff of IBM's East Fishkill facility has pioneered the mapping of transistors and integrated circuits with liquid crystals. This normal heat distribution in a cross-section of a transistor has a resolution of 10 microns in space and seven thousandths of a degree in temperature. This means that defects which might not show up even under X-ray inspection give themselves away with precision as hot spots to liquid crystals. Liquid crystal mapping on a macroscopic scale has been used experimentally in wind tunnel research. Here's a Mach 2 test in which turbulent flow shows up as blue and laminar flow as orange. This is a very handy and precise for the aerodynamicist. Another test at Mach 1.6. This work was performed by Dr. Enrique Klein while on a National Research Council Research Associateship Program at NASA's Ames Research Center. A Mach 3 test. Dr. Klein's work disclosed some problems with conventional thermocouple instrumentation, and in all, he reports that liquid crystals are a precise tool for mapping fine details of boundary layer flow. Liquid crystals were first described in 1888, and as late as the 1930s, there was still considerable research in the field, and then for about 30 years, they were literally forgotten. Right now, we're going to travel 2,000 miles to visit a man who's largely responsible for the current renaissance in liquid crystal study. Kent State University is a thriving liberal arts college of about 20,000 students in northeastern Ohio. Among its many research projects, it has the Liquid Crystal Institute, which is a center, an international center for research in this field. And we've come here to talk to Dr. James Ferguson, who is a pioneer and a leader in this field of research. And Dr. Ferguson, we've just uh, been talking to Dr. Chrissy, and he has shown us some thermal mapping applications and experiments which are indeed spectacular. And uh, I wonder if you could tell us what it is that we have really been looking at. What is a liquid crystal and why does it behave the way it does? Well, I think I'd like to show you a demonstration here. Good. I'll make you up a film. And liquid crystal is actually a state of matter uh, intermediate between a true liquid and a true crystal. It is, uh, uh, has some of the optical properties of crystals, yet it has the flow properties of a liquid. Well, are these always organic molecules? That make uh, these generally liquid so. You are, we are normally working with large molecules. Here's a typical example. Notice that it's large, elongated shape. Mm -hmm. And uh, here we have uh, a case where the molecules align parallel. Well, you said this is a typical example. Uh, are there many? Are there a lot of? Uh, well, there are over. There are over 3,000 known substances which form mm -hmm. liquid crystalline material. And you make some of them here, I presume? Yes, we have a, a library of some of the, uh, some 300 materials which form these, these phases. We've made uh, in excess of this. Uh, 
we have here a uh, material which we have made here, which has a pneumatic phase. Pneumatic. I now see. this is the simplest type of liquid crystalline phase. All right. How would you? How do you describe it then? It's, uh, well, other the than molecules, that term, which I'm afraid I don't, it isn't one that's familiar to me. Well, we have a uh, elongated molecule which mm -hmm. align parallel with its brothers in a, a generally parallel array, like toothpicks in a box. Mm -hmm. Now, if we were to pour toothpicks from a box, we would find that they would flow easily, easy along the long axis, but very difficult along the, the parallel, the perpendicular long axis. Now, what this does for us is, in the pneumatic phase, it allows a, an alignment to occur, and this alignment makes this material look crystal. I see it. So that the liquid property means the molecules are still quite free to move around. You They're can true liquids. Put your, can put your hand in and push them around, but, right. but the orientation will stay the same as this happens. Right. Right. Uh, that's and where this, the name crystalline then. But well, then how does that uh, result in these color changes with temperature? Well, in this case, we have a very special condition. And here we have what I represent to be the, the cholesteric phase. Now, that's another one than the one you just showed. Yes. Okay. It is but does it happen with the same kind of molecule, by the, the way? The same type of molecules, mm -hmm. rod-like molecules. And they align, if we were to depict the pneumatic phase like this, where the molecules are all, all lined parallel, up. Okay. then the cholesteric phase is twisted. Now, on the a helical arrangement. Huh? Yes. Uh -huh. Now, notice that we have a periodicity, just like you would a have wave, in a right. gradient. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, this will scatter light if this this spacing is a wavelength of light long. Okay. So, and then if that means if you change the spacing a little bit, it would scatter a different color. frequency of light, a different color. Right. Okay. And the way it changes color is just to change the spacing. Well, now you've made uh, one of the, uh, you poured some liquid onto, what, are, what did you pour it onto, by the way? Well, this is very simply an embroidery hoop that we buy at the local dime store, and over this we stretch mylar and paint it black. We can demonstrate the sensitivity of this material by heating a paper with my hand. If you put, put the okay. hoop down on top, we can see the temperature pattern of my hand. Oh, yes. Now, I, this is simply the... Uh, heat that I imparted to the paper for, by and, touching it. And coming back up through the mylar and uh, transmitted from hand to paper and then back. That is indeed sensitivity. That's yes, indeed. Good. There are another, another way we might be able to do this is to make an eraser mark. Here you see the effect of friction on the paper, mm -hmm. warming it up, coming mm -hmm. through. Now, the, another important point is the pattern that we see, the fact that it is spatially resolved. We can tell the difference between two points which are one thousandth of an inch apart. Then a very, a very sensitive, uh, not only in temperature but in resolution of where the temperature is. Yes, we can say that we have uh, one million thermocouples per square inch. Well, talking about things that are very small in size, I know that you're also working with uh, photomicrography uh, in some of the research. Why don't we take a look at some of the results of that? Okay. Now, with the microscope, uh, of course, you can't see the actual molecules of liquid crystal. What, what do you use this setup to examine? Well, we can tell the direction of the long axis of the molecule. Mm -hmm. In liquid crystals, this is, a, this is particularly important. As we discussed earlier, the pneumatic phase aligns along its long axis. And uh, with the microscope, we can see this. This is, of course... Even though you can't see the molecule itself. That's right. Well, let's take a look at some of the pictures you've made with then with this. What can we see? Well, we can see the uh, pneumatic phase we have here, which is cooling, and we're going to see it uh, form from the isotropic liquid. Uh, the first material we have here is a pneumatic. What does that mean again, pneumatic? It comes from the Greek word meaning thread-like. This is the simplest of the liquid crystalline phases and is an ordered liquid. We see it here uh, forming from the isotropic liquid. The yellow droplets are the material as it forms. An isotropic and it, liquid is just an ordinary liquid? Is that and it's just an ordinary without liquid? Without any of the like crystalline structure to it. The threads that you can occasionally see here are the 
discontinuities and correspond to dislocations in true crystals. The jerks or motion that you see going through the material as these materials wet correspond to orientation waves. Another type of liquid crystal we mentioned earlier was the smectic phase, which comes from the term soap-like. I've heated up this particular material again to the isotropic liquid so we could observe it cooling down. Again, we see droplets forming from the isotropic liquid, except the droplets this time are rod-like instead of being spherical. That represents the actual uh, shape of the liquid crystals that are being formed? And well, these are liquid in two directions, the third direction being a planar configuration. Now, as these rod-like droplets come together, notice they again wet each other and flow together. These are closer to crystalline orientation than the pneumatic liquids. They look more like crystals, yet they flow very rapidly and very quickly into a, an orientation. Here we have a special cholesteric phase that crystallizes readily. Notice that it is moving across as long, almost discrete fingers. The rate of motion across the screen is quite rapid and we have a definite flow with the black areas are, are air bubbles. Since we're using polarized light, they do not show any effect. Notice how they are pushed ahead of the growing crystal wave front. Jim, I know that you have also found effects besides temperature, which uh, cause uh, some rather spectacular reactions in liquid crystals. What, uh, what other things will affect them? Yes, we're studying the effect of vapor. Uh, one of the things that we've found is that uh, organic vapors, which do not react chemically with liquid crystals, change their color much the same way that uh, temperature change does. Now, I have, for instance, in this uh, Erlenmeyer flask, a, uh, a little chloroform vapor. As you see, as I pour on this film, I change the color the same uh, way that... <laughs> that, that happened very quickly. Uh, the temperature change occurred. Now, that I, wasn't because the vapor's cold. Oh, no, it was a different direction, as you can see. Now, does it work the same for any gas? Uh, it works different for different materials. For instance, uh, uh, chloroform will change some materials uh, blue while changing other materials red. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, we can tell a difference, for instance, between uh, chloroform, carbon tetrachloride, benzene, almost any organic solvent by the way it a liquid crystal will respond to it. Uh, I also uh, heard that there are some electromagnetic effects on the behavior of liquid crystals. Uh, what are the, these? The liquid crystals, because of their elongated molecules, will align with fields. Mm -hmm. And as I said earlier, we uh, could see a difference in viscosity depending on the direction of flow. Well, with uh, an application of a magnetic field, you can change the viscosity. Uh, mm. the, apparent, the apparent viscosity just by aligning the molecules in a different direction. So you can with actually exert, uh, exert some control on flow of, of materials through, right. through pipes can, and so on with this. You can uh, uh, decrease uh, things like turbulent flow because you can cause them to flow better in a straight line, or you can increase the viscosity at a, at a, at a predetermined point in order to get better power exchange. I know also you have been uh, uh, working with ideas of the position liquid crystals play in living organisms. I suppose that uh, perhaps this vapor uh, demonstration here is, could that be connected, for example, to the sense of smell? Well, we have something very similar. We have the ability to tell the, uh, the effect of uh, uh, geometric form of the molecule. We have a system here which is extremely sensitive. The limiting sensitivity is about the same as the nose. Uh, and we have these materials in the nerve tissue. So we have everything present in the body which we have here. The, on the case film. is persuasive then. The right. liquid crystals are involved. This business about uh, carrying messages, does this imply that liquid crystals could be associated with uh, nerve impulses? And, and yes, we've, uh, we've done some interesting uh, calculations along this line, and we find that the propagation velocity of this 
twisting wave or torque wave we've been talking about is in the same order as the velocity of propagation of nerve impulses. What is the velocity, by the way? Uh, it takes a tenth of a second for the average man to get a signal from his big toe, for instance, to his brain. Okay, that puts it in, in numbers. Uh, uh, so it's possible then that the liquid crystals could be involved with the, or could be the actual message carriers in a nerve cell. But it yes. is a, it's a liquid crystal phenomena that the, nerve, that the message gets. Yes, we could have this and our, as I say, our velocity turns out in the right ballpark. We have uh, a mechanism for operating the axon. That is, it's always been a puzzle how the acetylcholine comes from the inside of the nerve to the outside of the nerve. This would be explained by our torsional wave. And uh, we would also be operating a more viable system in a highly conductive media. At Princeton, New Jersey, a 33-year-old scientist was named Outstanding Young Electrical Engineer of 1968 by an engineering society for his liquid crystal research. Meet Dr. George Heilmeyer. Here at RCA Laboratories, we've been primarily interested in the electro-optic effects in certain classes of pneumatic liquid crystals. And in particular, we're interested in reflective electro-optic effects for display type applications. Now, by way of introduction, there are basically two types of displays. Those which emit light, such as the conventional TV tube and a ne neon bulbs of one kind or another, and those which reflect or modify light, such as the printed page or a photograph. Now, there are many physical effects by which one can electronically control the emission of light, but there are relatively few physical effects by which one can electronically control the reflection of light. Now, displays based on the electronic control of reflected light or ambient light, if you will, might be expected to have two rather obvious advantages. First, since, that, since they are reflective, they should be viewable in a wide range of ambience, including direct sunlight. That is, their contrast is constant, independent of the ambient. And secondly, since the addressing circuitry does not have to supply the power necessary to emit light, the potential addressing power requirements are much lower. Now, we've been interested in reflective electro-optic effects in certain classes of pneumatic liquids. And we've called the particular effect of interest dynamic scattering. Now, devices based on dynamic scattering are fabricated in, in a very simple manner. The device consists of two pieces of glass with a transparent conductive coating on the inner faces. To fabricate a device, one simply takes a drop of the liquid, places it on one of the plates, and forms a sandwich by placing the other plate on top. Now, since the active layer of the liquid is only of the order of a mill thick, that is one thousandth of an inch, and held between the plates by capillary action, none of the conventional problems of handling a liquid are experienced. With no field applied, the liquid is initially transparent. When one applies an electric field, the material becomes opalescent. Now, this opalescence is not due to any electrochemical effect or any chemical change. This is due purely to the scattering of light induced by the presence of an electric field. With the help of Lou Zanoni, let's take a look at an image based on dynamic scattering. Here we have the two pieces of glass with the pneumatic liquid sandwiched in between. When, when Lou applies that 45 volt battery to the sample, the areas which are in direct contact with the field become white due to the scattering of light. The initial tendency for a pneumatic liquid crystal in the presence of an electric field is to align in that field. To this aligned system, we add an ion in transit between the electrodes. The ion acts as a sort of bullet and disrupts the, the orderly structure and produces scattering. Note that this possesses all of the characteristics of a true reflective image. The brighter the light, the brighter the display. Now, the power and voltage requirements of displays based on dynamic scattering are extremely low. And as such, they lend themselves to portable instrumentation of all types. This is a digital voltmeter with a pneumatic liquid crystal readout. In this case, we're reading the voltage of a solar cell. Now, I mentioned previously that the initial tendency of a liquid crystal in an electric field is to align in that field. 
we have another effect which we call guest-host interactions which makes use of this alignment. To the transparent pneumatic liquid, we add a dichroic dye molecule. A dichroic dye being a dye whose color is a function of its orientation with respect to the incident light. In this case, we see that in the areas where the voltage appears across the liquid, the dye color is switched. This work, incidentally, has been sponsored by the NASA Electronics Research Center. The colors that one can switch are almost limitless, depending on the particular dye which one use, uses to dope the pneumatic liquid. Here we see an example of several different dyes. Thank you, Lou. Now, the logical question that one might ask an industrial research scientist is when are devices based on these effects going to be commercially available? Well, the answer to that question is that some of the simpler devices based on dynamic scattering, such as the electronically controlled window and certain types of uh, numeric indicators might be available quite soon. But the more sophisticated applications, such as the flat TV panel for the wall or the portable TV set for the beach, are going to require a great deal of development work. Primarily, the problem centers about the addressing circuitry, which is quite complex. And while integrated circuit technology has advanced to the standpoint where large arrays can be fabricated, this doesn't seem, to be, uh, doesn't seem to place them in the economic realm of a consumer product at the present time. It's our opinion that both Dr. Ferguson and Dr. Heilmeyer are overly modest about their work. It's possible that some fundamental secrets of life and some highly desirable gadgets of modern living are much nearer to resolution than they will admit. Now, the range of applications is broad. There are toys, of course, photocopying processes, non-destructive testing, all sorts of sensing and monitoring devices, even art forms. The missing link now is ingenuity and economy. If you'd like a list of sources of further information on the subject, just send me a stamped self-addressed envelope. And 16 millimeter copies of this program are available for purchase or rental from the University of California Extension Media Center. We'll be happy to forward your request to them. Our address is Interface. Post Office Box 146, Hollywood, California 90028.